I will talk to you about entanglement phase transitions, uh, measurement-based entanglement phase, tra phase transitions. Um, what I will be talking to you about is described um, in, in these two uh, papers. Um, the transitions that I will be uh, describing to you um, are based on a statistical mechanical model that exhibits um, a transition into uh, a spin glass phase, okay? Hence, um, the word vitrification there that has mystified uh, some of you. Um, this is work done with my student, uh, Jeremy Cote, um, who, apart from a brilliant uh, student, uh, also uh, uh, um, is the creator of this webcomic. And um, so I uh, give you this uh, because you can find really uh, really cool jokes for your slides, for your talk. So you're welcome. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. First, I will um, talk about something that is not quite uh, what we have been doing in our work, which is monitored quantum circuits, because I think uh, a number of people in the audience will be familiar with that and not so familiar with what I'm going to talk about. Um, what I will actually talk about is just having a volume low state and measuring the qubits of that state one by one and asking how does the entanglement entropy of that state evolve as we measure the qubits, okay? So it's a very simple, very simple question. Uh, then I will introduce the ensemble of states that uh, we will be studying, um, which are basically ground states of a model that's called the P-spin model, and I will explain what that is. And then I will show you the quantum circuits that generate um, the states that we want. And finally, I will show you the theoretical uh, uh, results for how entanglement um, behaves under measurement of these states, uh, of the qubits in these states, and also some experiments we did on actual quantum hardware. And then I will conclude. OK, so. Um, to formulate the question, I want you to imagine the, the following very simple setting. We have a set of Van Bell pairs uh, that I show here. Um, and I imagine a bipartition um, of the system such that I cut all the Bell pairs in half. Okay, so these are my subsystems A and B. And what I uh, am interested in is what is the entanglement entropy uh, across this bipartition, okay? Um, so, okay, here's the, here's the entanglement entropy. If I have n bell pairs, I'll have n bits of entanglement or n e bits, okay? Um, and now suppose I start measuring subsystem A, okay? I measure the qubits of subsystem A. So I measure the first qubit. Uh, the first bell pair collapses, and what I will get is now I will lose one bit of entanglement, okay? Now, second bell pair, I measure the qubit um, in subsystem A, I uh, lose another bit, and so on and so forth until I have no more entanglement entropy left, okay? So this is a volume law state. I measure the qubits one by one, and I track the entanglement entropy and what I find is the simple linear function, or basically simple function, that describes the evolution of the entanglement. And I can pose the question, do all volume low states behave this way? Or are there states for which this procedure will give me something that is qualitatively different? Okay? And what I want to show you in this talk is that there are, uh, I want to show you an example of volume low states where Doing this protocol of measuring qubits one by one will lead to a non-analyticity of the entanglement entropy. Okay. Now, in this, uh, in this, in the setting that I'll be talking about, we are looking at the ensemble average entanglement entropy of our class of states. Okay. And this ensemble I will define in a bit. And so, there is a, a, a non-analyticity here in the entanglement entropy that is associated with a criticality. So we go through a phase transition uh, as, we measure, as we measure the qubits, okay? 
Um, now, this is to be contrasted with um, a topic that has been uh, discussed quite a bit in the last few years, which are these um, monitored quantum circuits. And so the set this setting is different, and I want to spend a few minutes discussing this setting just to juxtapose the two. So um, these are quantum circuits that start from an initial state, evolve it in time, and then what we, what we assume is that at each point in time, there's a finite probability that each qubit will be measured. Okay? And so, um, of course, if at some point in time I measure all of the qubits, my entire state uh, entanglement collapses. Okay? And I get a classical configuration. But the question is, if I have um, a finite rate of these measurements, uh, will I stay with an initially prepared volume law state? Will I keep this volume law, or will I uh, uh, go to an area law uh, state? And uh, so what has been found is that basically uh, you have a critical uh, prob uh, probability for these measurement events beyond which you collapse and you obtain a, a, an area law phase. Okay? And there is a critical point that separates weak monitoring in which we have, we preserve our volume, initial volume law and, um, and, the, and the area law uh, phase. Now, these circuits, these properties that are studied with these circuits are steady state properties, meaning you imagine that you evolve for a very long time, you keep your rate of, of measurements uh, steady, and then uh, at, a, at some long time you measure the entanglement entropy of your state and you average over many circuit realizations to find the curve um, on the right, okay? In contrast, what I will be talking about is the simpler version that I showed you before. I have a volume low state and I just measure, okay? Sorry, yes? What do you mean by that monitor? Is that a measurement? The, these guys here? Yeah, these Yeah, these are measurement events. They measure a single qubit, all right? And what I'm varying, or what people are varying when they study this, these circuits, is the density of these, or the, rather, the probability of this measurement occurring or not. Okay. Okay. Um, why is this interesting? So, for, for the, so first of all, there is a criticality associated with these uh, measurements, and we would like to understand it. Okay. But there are challenges, and these challenges have to do both. Uh, with uh, how we implement things on the machine, but also the quantum hardware, but also um, uh, theoretically, how do, how do we describe these systems? So on the theoretical side, I put this on the theory side, but um, it is at least in part our responsibility as theorists to describe things that are somewhat measurable, at least in condensed matter, okay? And so, okay, how do we, how do we measure entanglement? Okay, so we have a volume low state. How do we measure its entanglement? How do we quantify entanglement uh, in these states? And that's not a priori obvious for volume law states. And it's not a priori easy. Um, if we are talking about entanglement phase transitions, we would like to understand how these, the physics of these phase transitions, universality, et cetera. So ideally, we would like an exact theory that says, Precisely, these are the critical exponents, et cetera, okay? Um, on the experiment side, um, implementing things on quantum computers currently in the near term is difficult because of uh, decoherence, but also because in many cases, we, will need, we need to post-select um, the, outcome, the, the outcomes of the measurements we make. And sometimes this post-selection is prohibitive. The cost of this post-selection is prohibitive because it gives us an overhead, uh, insurmountable overhead of how many shots we need to pull. And um, finally, these machines are noisy. Okay, so if we want to scale up, we need to overcome again um, fundamental limitations that we have in the quality of our qubits today. So in this talk, I would like to address uh, these challenges. Okay. Now. What are the states that we will be building? So I mentioned the p-spin model. Um, so this is a classical spin model. Um, the Hamiltonian is shown here. Okay, and uh, let me just walk you through 
this because sometimes when you say the word spin glass, people people shut down. But uh, it's like very, really very simple. So we have a set of n spins, okay, shown here as circles, and a set of um, three spin interactions, okay, shown as squares. The Hamiltonian looks like this. So it, the Hamiltonian is defined on a graph, a bipartite graph, like this. And uh, the terms of the Hamiltonian involve three spins each. So for each uh, interaction vertex, I associate, to each interaction vertex, I associate three spins, okay? So the spins are Ising-like, and also these couplings, the Js, uh, can take two values plus, plus or minus one, okay? And so this gives me the full, the full uh, Hamiltonian. So Vj here is the uh, set of uh, interaction vertices in the graph, okay, the black squares. Um, so this is called the p-spin model, and we will look at, uh, we are looking at the version where p equals three, so it's the three-spin model, okay? This model is interesting because um, it has uh, an extensive number of uh, ground states, okay? So it has a finite ground state entropy. And um, as we will see in a bit, um, exhibits glassiness in a certain regime. Okay, um, this model is particularly nice because it allows us to find its ground states relatively easily. Uh, if we do this uh, transformation from um, the j's and the sigmas to these x and y vectors, basically finding the ground states is equivalent to finding the solutions of this system of equations bx equals y modulo 2, okay? Some of you know this problem as XOR sat, and maybe some of you also know it as LDPC codes, okay? These are all equivalent. So only sigma j. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so how does, this, how does this model behave? So this has been um, extensively studied by the the Franco-Italian alliance of spin glasses, okay? So all these people like Parisi, Zekina, uh, Rich Terzenghi, et cetera. And so here's, here's the phase diagram. Um, before I say this, um, I wanted to show you, um, okay, we have the system of equations. Each time we add an equation, that constrains the parity of a subset of the qubits, okay? Parity means I divide the possible states in two sets, and one of the two sets is the ground uh, set, and the other one is excited state. So basically, by adding an interaction, I divide the number of, of ground states by two. Okay, so I start with two to the n possible configurations for n spins, and with each, um, with each um, constraint that I add, I divide uh, I divide by two. So a nice way to represent this is this B, this B matrix, okay, where it has N columns for uh, the spins and M rows for, um, for the constraints. And so basically the amount by which I, div I reduce my number of ground states is the rank of this matrix. It's given by the rank of this matrix, okay? And uh, so the entropy, the ground state entropy is just the log of the number of solutions of this problem. So what, yeah? Does the fact that all of this is mod 2 change anything about how you define the rank? Or, or Excuse me? Is it still just the rank as computed with, with normal numbers or does the fact that everything is modulo 2, two calculus, does this? Here we, we calculate the, the, the Boolean rank. Yeah. yeah, right? So, um, how, how does the rank behave? Uh, well, okay, you add one row, okay, you pick each row at random, you pick the entries of the, uh, each row at random, and so what you would expect is that you add rows, you divide the number uh, of solutions um, by two, so your entropy should go down as n minus rank b, rank b grows linearly, and so you would go down um, 
to one solution as soon as your rank hits uh, n, right? Linearly. So that's that's what should happen, okay? Except it doesn't. Um, so in fact, uh, here is this ground state uh, entropy averaged um, over an ensemble of these uh, instances of this problem. Here you see this this linear um, uh, decay, okay, of the of n minus rank b. But then at a certain point here, you see that this that we have a, a non-analyticity of this function. And the reason for that is that as you add these constraints, eventually you hit a point where you pick constraints that are linearly dependent with the previous ones, okay? And so this happens at some critical density of constraints that is this alpha c, and the value for the three spin model is 0.91, et cetera, okay? So it's before, before we hit one. Now, why is this interesting? It's a system of equations modulo two. However, if you look at the spin model, it has these interesting properties. First of all, this, pro this point is a, is a critical point. And uh, at this point, uh, we have a phase transition between a paramagnet and a spin glass, okay? This uh, phase transition is signaled by an order parameter, which is this Q here, which is an overlap of, uh, of the solutions, of the spin values for different solutions. So this average here is over different ground states, over different ground states of, the, of a given instance. And then the, uh, the entropy is given by, the ground state entropy is given by the order parameter. Okay, so we have an order parameter. If we can evaluate the order parameter, uh, we can evaluate the entropy. And uh, on both sides here, uh, on both sides of this phase transition, we have exponentially many ground states. Okay? So that's the, that's the p-spin model and the behavior of the ground state entropy in this model. Now, what does this have to do with entanglement and quantum circuits? So we're going to model the ground states uh, of this model on a, on, a, on a quantum circuit, okay? So we start with this matrix B here, and let's look at the first, the first uh, row. We have six spins. The first um, constraint, uh, the first interaction takes in spins one, two, and six. So we do a, our spin to qubit uh, mapping, and uh, here I have a, a simple circuit that takes in the six spins and uh, an ancillary, uh, the six uh, spin qubits and an ancillary uh, uh, qubit for the interaction and stores the parity of uh, bits one, two, and six. Okay, that's for the first interaction. And this circuit now implements all of these interactions of my model. Okay, so actually if you squint and tilt your head, you'll see that this circuit here looks like uh, this matrix uh, here. And the gates, the one gates are basically a C naught with which we store the, uh, the parity onto the interaction qubit and then a swap. So basically, if you look at the circuit uh, here, we, ha we start with our spins on top and uh, we end up with the spins in the bottom. Okay, so basically we we interlace. we interlace them. So the idea here is we put the qubits that represent spins in the beginning in the old, uh, in the old plus state. So we have all of our spin configurations. And then at the output, we have the following. We have a state where for each configuration of uh, the interaction uh, bits, we have all possible solutions to the problem bx equals y for a given y, okay? And then how many y's do we have? Well, two to the rank b, okay? That's given because, that's given um, by what I showed you before, the solution of the system of the e equations bx equals y. Okay, so now we can ask the question, what is the entanglement between the, the variable and the interaction qubits? Okay, so I cut, uh, I cut the system uh, here between the two, and I ask at the output, what is the entanglement? 
Well, I already have the answer because uh, here, this state at the output is in a Schmidt decomposed form already. Each of the y's here is a single bit string, so it means they are all orthogonal. And for each y, the set of all solutions, the equal amplitude superposition of all solutions to the problem for this y is orthogonal to any other set of solutions for another y. Okay, so this is a Schmidt decomposition, and I already know the entanglement entropy for this. Okay, and so where do, when does, yeah? You get all of the outputs y, yeah. So, so here, all of the possible outputs um, configurations y are at the output. So if you think about these as LDPC codes, the y is the syndrome. And so you get a superposition of all syndromes. Okay, but, but there's a constraint on b, kind of, that it's full rank. Um, not, not here, yes. In, in the next slide, I will constrain no, it No, b. but I mean, otherwise, you, you don't get all the y's, right? If, if b is not full rank. Maximal rank. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, so, and eventually, so, so if you write this formula, you assume that B is full rank. So it already. will not be. Yes, eventually, you. Okay. Yeah, Good. this is coming up. Yeah. So, um, so here now I'm introducing measurement. Okay, and um, what's happening here is I I pick a B that is full rank by definition. So I pick enough constraints to make this uh, B matrix B full rank. Um, now. What I do is I measure uh, a subset A of uh, these, these interaction qubits at the output. And then I ask, how does the entanglement entropy evolve as I measure uh, more and more of these interaction qubits? Okay, and what I want is a function of the entanglement entropy, um, the entanglement entropy as a function of um, this ratio of uh, the number of qubits in this region A over my number of spins. And you will see why I, I choose this, uh, this parametrization. So the full rank is N, okay? And by measuring a few, uh, a few of the interaction qubits, I'm reducing, um, I'm reducing the entanglement. Uh, by how much? Well, by the, by the rank of the sub-matrix that corresponds to this region A. So basically, my entropy um, is reduced by uh, the rank of this PA, so N minus rank PA. This is the ground state entropy uh, for the spin glass, uh, for this P-spin model defined by the matrix PA. Okay? And so what this, what this uh, shows you is that I get the entanglement entropy defined by my ground state entropy of the, of the spin glass model, okay? And this is exact. So the protocol here is let's prepare an initial state of all possible uh, spin configurations. Let's uh, store all the parities or syndrome, syndromes, and then let's start measuring the syndromes and measure the entanglement entropy between the two uh, parts, okay? And so if this is the case, uh, I already know, I'll, okay, so here's another way to, to, uh, to look at this um, more intuitively. Basically in the paramagnetic phase, each measurement that I make of these parity qubits is 50-50, okay? Uh, there's, no, there's no correlation between the parities. Once I go into the spin glass phase, uh, the, the measurements become correlated and the rank does not anymore go down by one bit every time I measure uh, an interaction qubit. That's because um, the extra constraints that I enforce by measuring the interaction qubits uh, are not linearly independent with the previous ones, okay? So here's, um, here are the theoretical results for what I... Uh, what, we, what I expect to happen uh, with my entanglement. Okay, on the right I have uh, an order parameter. This is the spin glass order parameter evaluated for my, uh, uh, for my problem. This alpha, I remind you, is um, the ratio of the measured uh, region to the number of spins. 
And what I see here is that the order parameter jumps from uh, zero to some finite value at precisely the, the critical point uh, predicted by the spin glass theory. And uh, here I define a quantity uh, um, that I call entanglement susceptibility, which is basically the derivative of my entanglement entropy um, with respect to alpha, this parameter. Okay. And so what I see is basically it reflects, it reflects uh, the same thing as what the order parameter um, is showing me. So we have an exact functional form for how the entanglement entropy should look in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, and that comes again from spin glass theory. So the spin glass phase um, transition leads to a non-analytic behavior of the entanglement entropy in my quantum circuits. And uh, because I have an exponential number of solutions on both sides of this transition, this is a volume law to volume law uh, transition. Okay. And so the next thing that we would like to look at is the, um, the criticality of this um, transition. And you can, you can see this here. Uh, we do a finite size collapse of this uh, entanglement susceptibility. And we, extract, uh, we can extract the, the critical exponent, the new exponent. And we find uh, value 1.9, which is basically what we expect, again, from spin glass theory. Um, okay, so these are all theoretical predictions. How does it work, or does it work, in reality? Um, so we implemented these circuits on the IBM quantum computers. We used uh, a bunch of their devices, and we, we used a bunch of tricks to do these experiments, um, which I'm not showing here, but I can discuss afterwards. And here I'm showing the results for um, three system sizes up to 48, uh, using up to 48 qubits. The solid lines uh, here are the classical, um, the classical calculations of the uh, order parameter. Uh, and the, the points are what we get from the device. Okay, and what we see is that we get the, the sharpening of, of the phase transition. Okay, here we do, uh, we do again a finite size collapse. I wouldn't you know, pay too much attention to that, but at least what we get out of it is consistent with, with uh, reality. And um, again, we find, we find the, right, the right critical exponent and the right position for the, for the phase transition, okay? Okay, so going back to, um, to these challenges, what, what have we achieved? We, um, we, we have succeeded in measuring entanglement because in this particular system, measuring the order parameter is one-to-one -one, uh, mapped to uh, measuring the entanglement entropy. Uh, we have an exact theory in a non-trivial limit uh, for these circuits. Um, a large part of uh, what is happening with, with uh, monitored quantum circuits is people try to develop uh, statistical mechanical theories of these phase transitions at some in some limit of high dimension of, of uh, uh, high dimension of local uh, Hilbert spaces, etc. Here, we don't do any of that. The theory, the statistical mechanical theory, is exactly in the experimental limit. Um, for for, um, for our experiments, uh, we don't need to use post selection. There's a procedure of uh, using basically all of the shots that, um, that pass a certain sanity check. Uh, and the sanity check is basically um, simply does this, does this hold? Okay, so we measure an x, we measure a y, and then we look at does bx equal y? Okay, so this allows us to post-select, uh, um, well, not to post-select, but error mitigate, okay? So this is our procedure for, for error mitigation in this case. Um, and so basically by, by looking at this, the fact that we can go up to 48 qubits, basically at the time that we were doing these experiments, we were using the, the biggest machines um, 
of IBM to, uh, to generate volume law entanglement reliably okay, and to measure it. Question about that. I didn't quite understand the whole error mitigation scheme, so it seems like you could do the measurement and then confirm classically that whether the state was, had good properties or not. That's right. But then what do you do after that? Like, what if it, what if it doesn't? Have Check it out. Okay, and I will show you how about this. Oh, okay. you mean just, just throw it out and yeah, start yeah, yeah. over? Yeah, oh, so okay. Do we have any any people who are affiliated with IBM? <laughs> okay, so their qubits are. I think the talks are recorded, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, I'll say it anyway. So the qubits are crappy, right? They are not. <laughs> they're not. They're not that great. And in fact, uh, I can show you how how much. Uh, so I have this extra slide here. Um, this is the, the proportion, proportion of shots that we uh, keep or throw out, of good shots, yeah. This is the proportion of shots that we keep, okay? And so you can see that it's dependent on alpha, but you can see that in the worst case and for the largest uh, systems that we looked at, which are 48 qubits, here it says 24 because 24 is the spin part of the, of the system. Uh, you need, you know, about 10,000 shots to get one good one, okay? Um, so there's that, huh? Yeah. Yes. So how is this different from uh, post-selection? I mean, yes, it is post-selection, but like in, in other protocols, um, you are not, you are not even able to, um, in, in other protocols, you are not even able to, because you don't keep, so here I, I mentioned that we have these, um, you know, we have the syndromes, right? The syndrome bits here after post this measurement. And this allows us to, let me backtrack. So in order for us to do, to evaluate this order parameter, this is an important point. Here, we need to, eva we need to evaluate the overlap of different solutions to the same instance, meaning to the same parity configuration. But when you measure this y out vector that I'm showing, you don't, you're not guaranteed that you will get out the same y. Okay? So what you would have to do is measure an exponential number of times until you hit two solutions for the same y. Okay? And that's, that's what I mean. Post, that, I would need post-selection to, uh, to have good shots. Instead, what we can do, because we have these syndrome bits and because this is an error-correcting code, is we can rotate to the zero, uh, we can error correct, basically. And so we can use all of the shots. Yes? If there weren't any errors. Exactly. Yeah, so not, in this case, the errors are not, they are not errors, they are just different uh, parity sectors, right? Yes? Uh, yeah. Um, maybe I'm missing something here, but as I see it, that the entire circuit is a Clifford circuit. So yes. Why do you run it on a quantum computer then anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, okay, that's, that's a good point because here this, this is not, um, I'm not trying to compute something. What I'm trying to do is really realize a state of, uh, really realize a state of matter or a state, a quantum state uh, in a quantum phase transition on a, on a physical system, okay? So he, this is why I say qubit vitrification. The qubits actually go into a spin glass phase, right? So of course I can simulate a phase on my computer, but here I can do like, real physics with it, okay? Moreover, um, if I were to simulate the, the precise system on my computer, the exact system, this bx equals y, I would not be simulating what happens in the quantum computer, because the quantum computer is not just that. It's a bunch of other things, okay? Yes? Um, yeah, I'm wondering, so what, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, what would happen, like, how relevant is it that your initial state is, like, all things in plus versus if you just let them completely dephase and ran the same circuit? Good point. So, and I have the answer right here. Um, so here, what I'm showing is um, simulations of, and this goes to, to a comment that I wanted to make anyway. Here I have two sets of curves, the blue ones and the, the red ones. The blue ones are the old plus state. The red ones are the same experiments, but starting with a hard random state for, uh, for the spin qubits. So in fact, the circuit in this case is not Clifford because you have a, uh, 
you have a uh, well, you have a non-Clifford non state, non-stabilizer state in the beginning. But these are not experimental because, you know, actually doing these experiments and building these non-stabilizer non, uh, states is expensive. Well, I guess, sorry, I'm, I'm not so much curious if they're hard random, but what if they're just incoherent equal mixtures of 0 and 1? I guess I'm wondering if you can get this transition without entanglement effectively by just starting with a probability distribution. Um, How indicative is this order parameter showing the transition? of there actually being volume law entanglement in the system, or could it happen without volume law entanglement? Um, it cannot happen without volume law entanglement, because um, here, just because of all the C0 gates, they just generate the entanglement. Uh, and you cannot, you cannot have, um, to have these correlations shown here, right, of the measurements depending on one another, you need you need to have some correlation, and the only type of correlation you can have is uh, entanglement in this case, right? Because there's no other way to correlate the two, the two uh, sides of the system, right? How, how else would I do, uh, how else could I correlate the, the qubits on the quantum computer? Well, I mean, a CX gate can generate classical correlations, right? Yes, yes, but if you add classical correlations onto a plus state, uh, then how do you generate entanglement, right? Or into any superposition, okay. right? You, what you're saying is, if I if I started with a mixed state, mixed state uh, for the qubits for the spin qubits, and then add correlations on top of that, whether I would get the same uh, the same the same outcome. Yeah, like whether this could be understood as the dynamics of kind of a classical cellular automata, where you don't actually need the coherence between the initial qubits to make it, to make the transition happen in that order parameter. I mean, okay, the the overall um, the overall system, uh, the overall spin glass system is a classical system, right? So, yes, this is. Uh, a stat -mech, classical statmec model of something that happens in a, on a quantum computer that is in a superposition, right? But that's the name of the game with all, all of these, these classical descriptions of monitored quantum circuits. People are looking for a statmec theory to describe what happens uh, on the quantum computer. If you randomly picked, uh, yes, okay, I, I see the point. Yes, so here, yes, because yeah, if you look at the circuit here, um, it only con it only contains C naught gates. So this is a, in fact, the circuit is classical, right? So it's a it's a it's a reversible classical circuit. The the important point is that. You, you start with a superposition here, right? So, okay, if you, what you say is, let me pick a random configuration and, and run it through, right? And I pick, I pick um, the initial configuration of the spins at random, would I get the same measurements? The answer is yes, yeah. So in, in a sense, I cannot really, uh, Without further evidence, I cannot, uh, I cannot claim that uh, I have a quantum coherent system, yeah. But the, the um, yeah, the, the point here is that uh, given that we know that these systems have some coherence in them, and given that these systems are, the, our circuits are very, very shallow, in fact, uh, we believe that uh, we start with a coherent state. Okay, other questions? All right, so um, the remarks that I, uh, the first remark is something that uh, I already talked about. We have an exact mapping um, of this uh, entanglement uh, criticality in terms of a spin glass uh, statmic model. Uh, regarding volume law entanglement, um, in, in principle, if I want to measure entanglement entropy, I would have to do full tomographic reconstruction of a 
quantum state, which is a very costly, um, is a very costly uh, procedure. And in this case, we show that we can avoid it. Um, yeah, the next, the next um, comment is about uh, other theories of, statmic theories of uh, these measurement-based uh, phase transition transitions that um, develop theories of percolation or capillary flow or quantum error correction that are in various limits, whereas in this case, um, the limit is the actual experimental limit. Um, and uh, the final uh, remark that I want to make is that you can start from, from generic volume low states and still observe uh, the same criticality. Uh, okay, so um, the conclusions are these, and um, I would like to acknowledge um, our, uh, our funders. And now I'll take your questions. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot, Stefanos. Um, do we have some more questions? Yes, in the back. So is that correct to think that you're sampling from a uh, spin glass phase, so quantumly? Yes. And if you take a problem that is not easy to solve classically, could you sample from that, like some, some problem that have very hard, very hard classical solution in principle with this strategy? Yes. If you were able to build the superposition of all solutions to a hard uh, problem, then yes, you would be sampling the solutions. The question is, can you do it? So if you try, for example, to, to do the same thing with 3SAT or some other SAT problem, then you'd realize that it's not as simple. Okay, so we're not claiming to solve NP-complete problems here and sample the solutions of NP-complete problems. Now, Classical is simulating the distribution from which you pull the solutions in this case, meaning actually simulating what happens on the quantum computer. This quantum computer or these quantum computers that we use, that could be a hard problem. Okay. The amplitude of your state contain basically the classical probability of the Boltzmann distribution. Or is that, is that a good way to understand it? This is all, this is all zero temperature. So, yes, it Boltzmann is. Boltzmann distribution is zero temperature. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Another question? So you have a remark about that you can uh, map onto a statistical like disorder uh, problem. So I wonder, is there any randomness in the uh, Hamiltonian you started with? Yes. The, the randomness is uh, this matrix B. So I sample. I sample the rows of this matrix here uh, randomly. So I pick the positions where the ones are, are they are picked randomly for well, each maybe, row. Maybe going back to the P spin model. Yep. Is that in the J coupling or? It's the J's, yes. Okay, yep, thanks. Actually, it's two things. It's the, the sign of the J, which is, uh, sampled randomly at when you measure, and is the structure of the graph, which I sample classically, randomly. Yifre. Yes, no, what do you mean by your last point in the conclusions? That it, it applies to more generic volume states? Yeah, so um, the, thing, the f thing that we have tr tested is that, okay, it applies to random states, initializing the spin qubits to uh, random uh, quantum states, okay, random volume low states picked from, um, you pick basically each coefficient at random. Um, but yeah, if I am allowed to speculate, um, what I would like to see uh, in the future is, suppose we do this, we go into the regime of monitored quantum circuits and we do many rounds of this procedure. Here we measure just once. But then imagine that we re-entangle using H gates and then we measure again and again and again and do a, a, a protocol uh, like the other monitor quantum circuits uh, uh, studies out there. Could this, could our approach allow us to get an analytical handle on 
on that more general context. But, but I'm still confused about the first statement. So you say that if you start with a random volume low state, yep. and you measure, start measuring qubits sequentially, do you have a statement about the remaining entanglement between some of the qubits and the rest of the qubits? Yeah, what I mean is that here, instead of putting, the, putting my, cube, my spin qubits in the old plus state, I put them in a random volume loss state. But then I still do the same protocol. Oh, of the, like, the one to six? Yeah, the one to six. And then the one, two, three, four, they remain the same. And then, but I, then I measure the one, two, three, four. Okay, at the okay end. thanks. 